our second vlog tonight, uh, I'd like to welcome Greg, talking on Doctor for Web Development. You take it away, Greg. Will do. Okay, so I've been uh, doing Docker for a number of years now. Uh, got into it kind of when it started, and now it's a little old hat. It's kind of like, uh, I was just thinking, it's it's like now it's going into the room and turning on the light switch. You don't even think about it. So when I was getting ready for this presentation, I'm like, oh, wait, what do I actually know about Docker? Because I'm just used to hitting up or running a previous command that I've done. Uh, but I imagine for a lot of you, it's, it's a little newer. Uh, so I want to start off with uh, some of the basics of what is Docker. Um, and this, this actually hit me along the way because uh, Docker's gone through a, a bit of a renaming. Um, now all their open source code is part of this Mobi project. And Docker itself is, I think of it now as just a trademark. It, Docker is whatever the Docker organization, organization wants it to be, what they want it to do. Uh, there are a lot of underlying technologies, though, um, that uh, you know we really associate with Docker. Now, of course, those are actually technically under the Mobi name in the open source world. So <clears throat> what are those underlying technologies? Well, so Docker itself is operating system virtualization as opposed to hardware virtualization. You're not emulating a home machine. You're just um, segmenting some processes uh, apart from some others that are all running under the same Linux or now Windows kernel. Uh, there's a daemon that runs uh, as root that kind of manages the uh, provisioning of these containers because uh, they all, like, Configuring the networking, configuring uh, the file system mounts, all these things require root permission. And that's all done by this daemon. Um, and that operating system level virtualization is done through these three kind of main um, umbrellas uh, that are relatively new. They were like new in Red Hat 6. And those are the kernel namespaces, control groups, and capabilities. Um, so kernel namespaces, that's like we have a on a regular Linux system, we have a process hierarchy. Everything starts with an it, and then you know that's its parent, and then you can have a hierarchy there. But there's just this one uh, gigantic tree uh, with the namespaces. You can uh, tell a certain process to start in its own process hierarchy, and that's all it gets to see. Um, but that's all. That's very lightweight. You know, all you're doing is when a process in that other tree asks for the other processes, it just gets this other list uh, without, you know, having a separate uh, x86 emulator for this kind of stuff. It's just a, the kernel call has a different result uh, if you're running in a namespace. And control groups are kind of like quotas for these processes. And capabilities are um, another feature where, and you can use this stuff outside of Docker too, uh, where, you know, we'd all kind of gotten used to, if you want to do something uh, that requires root permission. You have to become root, and then you get to do everything. You can do whatever you want. But if you just have a process, uh, like you want to run a simple web server, and you want it to run on port 80, um, normally, well, before capabilities, you would have to become root, uh, connect, uh, reserve that socket for yourself, and then drop your root permissions. With capabilities, you can say, uh, you know, as root, you give the, ex the binary uh, permission to uh, uh, attach to uh, root ports, you know, the reserved ports. And then that's all that that binary can do. It never once has the ability to, I don't know, mount a different block device. It, it can only attach to ports uh, below 1024. Uh, so those are kind of the three main things. And then... All ports have to be below 24, or is it just that they listed set of ports? Because I thought it was a listed set of ports, not just everything below. I don't know. I was just, yeah, that's just an example of a capability. Okay. You know, there, there are a bunch of them, there, and there's like, there's one capability that's admin, which is basically why you're doing this, but, uh, yeah, so those, uh, those have come along, and just recently in the uh, 414 kernel, uh, capabilities are now namespace. Um, just a nice little thing that's been coming up, but there's been a lot of progress. Um, 
Yeah, so, I mean, when we talk about Docker, we're talking about, like, building images, we're talking about logging, we're talking about volume management, all this stuff. Uh, but they're all separate things. You can do them all on your own. Um, it just kind of packages it into a neat little package. And just, uh, like, a side note, System D has taken advantage of a lot of this stuff, too. Like, when you're running um, regular daemons now on a Red Hat system, your, your process is... Yeah, it's containerized. And it's essentially the same thing that Docker's doing. It's just not called Docker. It's, you know, it's all these C groups, these namespaces, that kind of stuff. And you get a lot of fringe benefits from the lightweight virtualization. Um, so yeah, I, I know I talked very quickly there. Um, the key points are it's not hardware virtualization. This is lightweight. You can opt into the different parts of it. Um, with Docker, you just kind of get a, a standardized uh, way of controlling that. Um, but you can also do this stuff on your own, just like System D does, and get your own process hierarchy or whatever. Um, it's just doing all the things at once for you. So, now when we actually go into the Docker world, we're talking about how are we going to use this thing? And the very first thing you'll run across is a Docker file. And that's um, a, a set of commands that builds an image that you're going to run in Docker. Uh, and then, yeah, so a Docker image, you, you ran that Docker file, you ha which has like run commands that say like, you know, build, take an image from uh, this OS, uh, install my package, do some tests, and then, uh, you know, expose port 80, that kind of stuff. Uh, that Docker file then, when it's finally built, it's, it's an image sitting there. It's essentially a snapshot. And then you can instantiate that snapshot. You can tell it to start running. It'll, uh, Docker will create a container for you, and that's the running instantiation instantiation of a image. So you may have multiple containers from one image, all using the same base. Um, and containers themselves can persist their own data, but as soon as you delete the container, that's gone, and you can start another container from the image, uh, and you get a clean slate. Um, and one nice thing about Docker files as opposed to uh, doing something like uh, having an Ansible script build an AMI image that you then uh, instantiate is um, when you build that AMI, I'm talking about AWS, is in, uh, you have an EC2 image and you take a snapshot of it, that's what I'm referring to. Uh, when you have that, you have this one built thing and someone else can uh, build off of it, but uh, they can't, um, if, if you want to change something that had happened uh, in the building of that AMI, you have to start from the scratch, from scratch, from a, a blank slate and then rebuild and that takes a whole long time. With Dockerfile, every single step of the build is cached separately. So if um, your, your Dockerfile is saying like, build from this OS, install my packages, and then at, at the very end, um, you know, you're, you're compiling your code um, and you make a change and then you rebuild. The only thing that you have to do again is that last step where your code changed. You're not reinstalling the OS. You're not copying over libraries and things. That's all done for you. So it saves a whole lot of time. And then kind of the next layer after that, uh, we've been talking about building a single image a compose file uh, brings together multiple images. So you may have an image for your web server, an image for your database server. The compose file tells your computer, you know, bring up this web, bring up this database, connect it to, they want to share these ports, um, and maybe you want to have three in, in instances of the web server running. That's all handled by compose. And then the next step after that is orchestration, which is like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm, where you're uh, taking essentially a compose file. You're taking uh, a description of the services that you want to run and spreading that out over a cluster of machines. Yeah, you think we've been covering this so far. But. Uh, so, well, any, sorry, before I go into these details, do it. any questions so far on what I've covered? Now's a good time. Okay. 
So I just wanted to cover some of uh, these capabilities that Docker has because of the namespaces. Um, so this lightweight virtualization, um, each running container has its own mount namespace, so you can mount volumes from the host into a container. You can, if you wanted to, you know, mount some drive and have it only available to one specific container. Where this really comes in handy is if you're doing local development, you want to mount your um, local project root into a container so that the container can run it in a standardized environment uh, without having to, uh, you know, a lot of developers might run OSX or something. And they can run Docker and have Docker running their uh, whole server environment and then have their project root outside in OSX and be able to uh, just share files instantly, kind of just like um, uh, mounting in a virtual machine. Uh, the PID namespace we talked about, uh, network namespace, similar thing uh, in Docker, you can give each container its own um, you know, bridge. You can create a, its own networking interfaces. You can uh, have bridges between containers. You can have uh, you can bridge out to your Ethernet or whatever. It's just like anything you can do on host, you can do inside of a container and give it its own private networking. Um, user namespaces is new. Um, this is like inside of your container. Uh, your processes will run uh, with, you know, before this, if you were root inside your container, you had UID zero. So if you wrote files uh, to the system and they were shared with the host, you'd be writing as UID zero. Uh, with this, the files you write would have a different UID. Uh, just give you a little more security. And you can do other different kinds of mappings, like maybe your web server. You want to map to your user UID, that kind of thing. Uh, containers have their own host name and uh, their own IPC for Postgres at all to communicate. Um, yeah, and control groups is kind of the... Uh, so. The namespacing was segmenting them. Control groups is uh, give, dividing up resources fairly, um, so making sure that one container can't take over, you know, your entire CPU or uh, kill your disk. You can throttle all these things, and these are all available, you know, when you're instantiating your containers. Um, generally in Dev, I don't have to set them, but they're available to you if you, you know, had it more complex needs than I do. <laughs> yeah. Does that come with reasonable weight uh, limits on these, or are they just not set? They're not set. Yeah, so it's, yeah, uh, like, uh, I'll typically develop, be developing and have a web server running, and it's exactly the same as if I had started it through system D. You know, it has the okay. same ability to run rampant on my system. But it also, what's nice about it is compared to hardware virtualization is you don't have to reserve these resources. They're only being used if they're being used. So it's very easy to have uh, several uh, web servers running uh, in a way that I, you really couldn't if they were separate virtual machines. You know, they're only using the memory that they're actually using. They're only using, well, everything. It's like I presume they can share um, <coughs> pages like immutable code is shared between machines, right? Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. They're the same version. Yeah, so it, it'll depend on a couple of factors. Um, so the way Docker uh, stores its layers can be different between uh, different, different operating systems and d different depending on what your host file system supports. So like if you have ButterFS on your host, uh, your uh, Docker uh, images, your image layers will also just use uh, ButterFS snapshots. Uh, so at the block level, all your files can be shared across containers just because they're ultimately referencing the same blocks on disk. But then um, if, if you're not using ButterFS, if you're using like ext4, something like that, you'll, you'll be using a different... I'm thinking more of like the shared, uh, shared pages and memory, things like this. Well, yeah, like those the files. The will be the same for all the containers, even though they're all, they're all using the same. 
Unless they're using a different type of seed. Yeah. So that wouldn't be shared. Um, but just the files, file system layer cache could be shared. But each container is going to have its own essentially operating system in it. Except not. Yeah. Uh, so, yes and no. Some sharing, but not all. Like, the files themselves, their cache will be shared across multiple containers, but the shared libraries are not shared across containers. Uh, yeah. So how does a separate operating systems work? Docker works on Windows. Does it create virtual Windows machines and not virtual units? Yeah, um, if you're, so it, it, Docker is not about uh, operating system virtualization. If you're running um, Mac or Windows, you're using their own hypervisor to start. Um, you know, uh, like if you're running Linux under Windows, then the Windows hypervisor is starting a Linux OS that then can start multiple containers, and it can work as if you had your own Linux operating system uh, sharing multiple containers, but it is its own virtual machine. Um, but if Windows is starting Windows VMs, then I, I think it's more like uh, the Linux experience where you're not running a separate virtual machine. But it's still hyper. So it's Okay. I, I, and I think Mac is working on C group kind of stuff, but yeah. uh, as far as I know, they're not there yet. Yeah, but nothing's descended. So let's get started. Okay. So those are, those are kind of the details that uh, you have to know to understand what's going on, like what are, what the benefits are. But um, if you're just working day to day, this is what you deal with day to day. Uh, so I'll just walk you through this is a sample Docker file from one of our projects. It's we're pulling from Fedora 26, and as soon as uh, the Docker build hits that, it knows. Uh, it's not prefixed with the host name or anything. It's going to fetch the, uh, the, it'll connect to the default Docker hub and pull the Fedora image version 26 down. Uh, and then you'll have that cache locally. Exposed port 80 just tells it, you know, I'm going to be making this port available. Entry point is, uh, by default, when you start uh, a container from uh, an image built from the Docker file, it'll run that command inside of the container. That's the default start command, but uh, you can override that when you're running a container, which is you know helpful for debugging or something. But if someone's just starting a container from your image, that makes it much easier for them. They don't have to know what command to start. They can just start your image. And then uh, we just run a few commands, like we're downloading, uh, we're setting up the node repository, adding a user, installing a bunch of packages. And here's one of those capabilities I was talking about. This is the net bind. So this is letting node bind to port 80, which it wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Create a user. Uh, and this is kind of an important thing for developing. Is So here we've installed our OS and uh, the web server. And all these layers will be cached. But now this is these are my own project files, and these might um, these might change more often so towards the end. Uh, if I were to change my package JSON or yarn lock, it'll start at this command, copy the file over, and then do a yarn install, which reads from those files and installs a bunch of packages. And if those two files hadn't changed, then I would be starting my build here, where um, I should just add some context here. Um, when you build a Docker file, you're inside of a folder that uh, is also known as the context. Uh, so if I say docker build, it tars up my whole local folder, gives it to the docker daemon, uh, along with the docker file, and 
anytime I, I copy, uh, those paths are relative to the context that I sent to the daemon. So here I'm copying just the two files out of the context. Here I'm copying and all the rest. I copy it to the var www folder. Uh, so this, if I make any change anywhere in my project, I'll at least be starting to rebuild here. If I change those files, then I have to start there. But uh, that caching makes it, uh, you know, iterating on your development a lot faster because it don't have to do this step all the time. And if I have already run everything, if my files haven't changed, my container starts up almost instantly, which is great for um, deploying because I can build this whole Docker file locally. I can push that image up to a repository and a remote server. And then when that server starts, it has all it needs. It has already has my whole project file built. It can just start right away with the start script. And the last command is just the, the build command. Which points on those secrets? I'll call them checkpoints. Maybe that's not the right word. Which points would be checkpoints in that whole script? Every single step. Every single one. Yeah, like, uh, so this is a common uh, thing you'll see in Docker scripts is you combine multiple commands into one. Like this npm rebuild could be its own run command and then it would be cached separately but I know that if I'm ever changing one of those I have to do all those regardless I just I don't get anything out of caching those steps individually so I combine them all into one layer which again depending on the storage layer um, may have trade-offs like if I'm running butterfs it doesn't matter if I uh, mod a whole bunch of files because I'm just changing a small amount of metadata. Sorry, I didn't explain this. The ButterFS uh, storage layer uh, it works at the block level, so only the bytes that I change get stored in a snapshot. But if I'm running, if I'm not running in ButterFS or ZFS or uh, one of those file systems that support snapshots, uh, then I'm using the Docker um, storage. Um, Layer, sort of, I forget the name now, uh, overlay FS2 where each file is versioned. So if any change to a file happens whatsoever, it creates a new copy of that file. Um, so these layers can get expensive if you're not running a snapshotting file system. And that's why, just to be nice, it's kind of good to roll them up into one. This is a question? <laughs> yeah. Each of these establishes some form of a snapshot. Are those are those snapshots visible to you as a user, or are they sort of behind the scenes? A little bit of both. Um, you know, if I just run the command, it'll as it goes, it'll output you know using this cache layer, using this, uh, and then maybe not using cache, and it'll start doing the build, and I'll see them along the way, if, and I can take one of those layers, uh, they are their own image, and I can start a container from it if I wanted to. Um, so they are available, and, I, and if you run like the Docker images command, you'll see them there. They just don't have names. So it'll just be like image and then a hash, which I see in the output, but uh, you know, unless I'm following along with the output, I don't know what that, that hash is. But that's help, a helpful thing for debugging is you know, I, I, when I'm building this, it's, it's outputting the hashes of each step, and then you know I may wonder why something happened here, uh, and so in the output I can just check the the hash of that layer's image and start a container from it and explore without having to edit my Docker file. Any other? It's like a reversible program because it saves every step along the way. Yeah. Uh, that is, it is very nice and, uh, just one nice, another nice thing about it is you're always starting from the very beginning. So as long as I, I, I can give this Docker file to anyone and if I've, uh, you know, check it into Git and anyone can pull it and if I've made ch changes anywhere in this whole process, you know, maybe I upgrade it to Fedora 27. Uh, I don't have to tell anyone, it's just when they do the next build, uh, the build command will first start off and say, do I have a, a cache for Fedora 20, 27? And it'll say no, and it'll just start building 
from the very beginning and then cash it locally for them. Um, so Fedora 26, when it, when we got it there, it goes to some repository which presumably has some long cryptographic hash. So the next time you would say, even though I use the same name, it might be a different object, and I have to start over. Yeah. So the, uh, this 26 is a is a tag that they've given to one of those hashes. Um, if if I don't specify tag, it's just Fedora. It'll assume the tag latest. But uh, and then you can also say from and then give it a hash uh, if I want to fix uh, my version, you know, and never change. So does somebody put Fedora 26 updates in the thing labeled Fedora 26, or is it the permanently installed version? No, yeah, they, they do. I do see updates coming through to it too, um, and then. You can also have as one of your commands a yum or DNF upgrade, and uh, you uh, in, and then. But the trick there is uh, the way it's figuring out have I run this is it it uh, looks you know it hashes this command. Do I have that in my cache? And then uh, if that command were upgrade, it may have stored that it had run upgrade in its cache, but it doesn't know that there are new updates to well, pull. That's kind of what I was asking at the beginning, whether Fedora 26 would go back to some magic real hash and see if it's the same object every time. Okay, so um, yeah, it, it it asks your local Docker D uh, for its what it knows about what Fedora is. You know, Maybe you have a local image already stored. Maybe you downloaded that before. If you have something called Fedora 26, Locally, it'll use that. You can also tell the local daemon to pull and see if there's an updated version, in which case it'll pull that, and now uh, the cache for your old ones built from Fedora 6 for the old hash are no longer valid. Because it, it resolved that name to a hash before we're uh, doing the build. But that's kind of what you want, because there could be security fixes that really should be distributed everywhere. And yeah. The other version, like I've always thought that there's a lot of in this kind of world, there's a lot of taking snapshots and they can get stale uh, and be a security problem. Look at the problem that uh, Equifax had where they were using an old version of Strut and their process didn't give them the bug fix version. Yeah, and there's a, there's a great trade-off between getting those updates and having the snapshots. And I think this does a pretty reasonable job. Uh, it'll p check for updates if you tell it to. And, like I can always... Uh, uh, when I run my build, I can say, you know, ignore the cache, and it'll pull the latest from everything, and then I, I can push that up to our repository, and then in our uh, scripts to pull this, uh, you know, I, we can just always pull the latest from the repository, and and then I'm getting the latest built thing uh, without having to rebuild it myself. Someone has already taken care of that. Uh, you know, and it's probably an automated script that's doing an uncached build every day or two. Yeah, it should be a little bit like the problem of, of uh, CRL, um, certificate revocation, with, where, say, Fedora announces, sorry, we no longer stand behind this Fedora because it's got no security problem. Yeah. And nothing should use it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, now, Typically in production, though, uh, we're always just dealing with a specific hash, you know, an image that has been built. Yeah. That way we can, if there's a problem with it, we can roll back to something that's known good. Uh, and then just as QA approves new updates, we can push those. But there's always some known thing that we can roll back to if we have to. Uh, any more questions on the Docker file? Format, because yeah, I think we talked about a lot of this stuff. Talked about all of it. Uh, so I mentioned um, when it's doing the build, it tars the local folder, and that's called the context. Now that you can have a lot of stuff in your local folder that you don't care about. You know, maybe it's um, you know dumps your database or your .git folder, where you just don't want to waste the time uploading all that, even if it's just a local copy. So you have a Docker ignore folder, 
a file that uh, tells it all the things to ignore when it's doing that um, doing that tar. Uh, and another good reason to put stuff in the Docker ignore is um, like in one of those last steps in the in the Docker file was to copy all the files over. If I change something in one of these ignored uh, files, it won't bust the cache on that. So I'm able to you know change things in public or compile this or in my IDE folders, those kind of things, uh, without having to worry about the cache blowing up. Docker Compose. Uh, Docker File is all about just building one image for one container. Docker Compose is about uh, running multiple containers at once. So in this, you know, it's a YAML file, uh, version 2. We have these two services at the top level. We have a a web server and a database server. And by default, all the uh, containers in a Docker Compose file are using the same network. So these are able to talk to each other. Uh, and this is uh, setting, well, I'll, I'll continue to talk about the network. Uh, inside of either of these containers, they can talk to each other by name. So. Inside the Laravel container, it can do um, like telnet to database on port 5432, and it would, it would be able to open that connection. You know, it, that's one of the things that Docker Compose is setting up. It uh, sets up those host names so that each host knows about the other. And then it, it also loads environment variables from a file, and you can set local overrides. So your whole uh, environment is described by these compose files and uh, in an environment file you don't have um, local state in your containers at all. Uh, I can say that my DB host is database here on my local development and then in production we just change the DB host environment variable to point to the production server. And this is kind of where that comes in. Uh, the, it's normal to check in the Docker Compose YAML files to your sh your source code repository, and then you get ignore the override file where you set all the local things. So, like locally, I I, I uh, have this container listen at this local IP port 80 so that I can go to uh, my app Docker, and it knows that it's going to talk to this container. Uh, even though I may have, you know, this project running, I may have another project running. They each have their own local IP and their own host name that I can connect to. What does the double A mean? So this is saying, on the host, on that IP, port 80, connect that to port 80 inside the container. Like SSH underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Um, volumes you're mounting individual folders in. And this is just, yeah, in my SC host, that's how I made that work. Um, and uh, it'll, and so I work at a company where we, we deal with lots of websites for lots of different clients. I'll often have like three or four running at a time, which is, you know, something that Docker enabled that I really wouldn't have been able to do before. Uh, and, you know, I, it would have been a real challenge to have different versions of uh, web servers for different clients and different, you know, versions of PHP, different Node.js, different everything, uh, different operating systems. Uh, it would have been really hard to mirror all that uh, locally, whereas Docker just creates nice images that I can run and that are really lightweight that I can just leave them open and uh, just have a different tab in my browser for each one. What does it mean if an OS is used? You'd have Ubuntu on one and Fedora on another? Yeah. Yeah, because it looks like Ubuntu, even though it's running on top of Fedora, without virtualization. Even without virtualization. Yeah, it'll be the Fedora kernel, regardless. As, you know, assuming my host is running Fedora kernel, yeah. but everything else will be Ubuntu. Uh, yeah, I'll leave. And that, there's one caveat to that is that the, the kernel and the user space uh, stuff actually have to be compatible with each other. Yeah, how bad yeah. is that a constraint? 
it can be really bad if you actually have very big differences. Like if you're running the latest version of Ubuntu on Fedora uh, or, or a, or a Red Hat 5, for example. Like that would break. It, I, I haven't had that. Yeah, it hasn't been a problem for You probably have never done that large difference. How crazy well, you can't do it on 5. Yeah. Uh, but so I, I, I do. You could have said, okay, well, you know, you could be running this on the latest Ubuntu, and I'm trying to run it for, uh, Red Hat 5. That will still break, even though it, 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 you can containerize it. Right, yeah, Red Hat 5 is before Docker, so yeah. that's not working but regardless. That's but what I'm saying, yeah. You can't go too far back, but you can go quite a bit, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I know by accident, I had a machine which was running Fedora 20. I think, and the kernel was 24 because of some goofball thing with multiple UEFI uh, system partitions, and I never noticed any problems. Yeah. So yeah. We know. Yeah. I'd love to get both of you up here for a talk sometime, but in the interest yeah. of time, I know. Uh, yeah. Greg uh, is so running out of time. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so cleanup, you know, that we were creating all those. Uh, Snapshots along the way, you know, if you're dealing with a lot of projects or just code churn and all that, you'll want to have some cron job running on your system locally. This is the main one, the system prune, which deletes all the uh, those cache layers that are untagged. So just from time to time, you just delete everything that gets old. Uh, and there's some other versions here too that are like, if they're a certain number of months old, even if they're tagged, you know, I, I just don't care about them anymore. I'll just rebuild them the next time I come to them. Uh, cloud build, this is uh, for Google Cloud. It's been really nice to use. You just have a cloud build YAML file in the root of your repository and you give it the build steps. Uh, so you tell it you can pull from this branch and it'll pull an image and use that as the caching layer. And then it'll do a build and cache from what you just downloaded and you tag it. And then uh, you can deploy that to your servers. And that way, uh, you're not having to do these builds locally, these CPU intensive things. It's just happening in the cloud. And then when it's done, uh, you have a hook that you can say, deploy that to my server, or uh, you can download it locally. And all you're doing is having to download instead of doing a full, essentially, install of the system. Yeah. Have you ever done anything with Amazon Lambda? Not for, well, I've done Lambda scripts. But I haven't used it for Docker. They have uh, ECS, the Elastic Container Service, yeah. uh, which is, um, you know, saying like Fedora is uh, hosted in a repository. ECS lets you have your own private repository. So we do that for some projects and push our images there. And then um, thanks to AWS IAM um, permissions, your EC2 instances can be automatically provisioned to you know, have the rights to download images from ECS, uh, and ECS itself has some orchestration that will let you um, roll out an image to a, a number of machines. I forgot what the question was, but I talked a lot, so let's assume I answered it. Any other questions? Yep. Have you used the Heroku Docker deploy? Uh, no, not Heroku Docker deploy, just Git deploy. Uh, what else? Yeah, that's just a script we run on the server to pull it, and a, a simple script that just edits the Docker Compose YAML file on the server. You can, so I can tell my QA guy, uh, run the script, pass it the name of the branch you want to test out, and he can, you know, on his server just switch branches almost instantly. It's like under 10 seconds, which is crazy because without Docker, he would be doing a build every time he switched branches, but he just has to. You know, run switch branch, and it'll download the latest image, and really save them a lot of time. Uh, so that. So we got EV deploy. Amazon Elastic Beanstalk has uh, Docker built in. Um, there's some caveats though, like um, if you're used to Beanstalk, uh, you have the AWS uh, CLI EB command available. And you just run that in your project. It'll copy, it'll tar your whole file, send it up to S3, and then it'll deploy it to the EC2 instances that are 
load balanced by Beanstalk. Um, the, uh, and the normal one would build a, a regular AMI. Uh, with the Docker version, it sends your build context, puts it in S3, but then when it deploys, each machine runs through the whole Docker file. So that is uh, time. It's problematic because uh, you don't want your scaling to take like five to ten minutes, which you know a build, a full build might take. So instead, we have our own scripts that uh, kind of do what Google is doing, where you run the build either locally or in the cloud, and tell Beanstalk to uh, distribute the uh, that can, uh, the image hash and deploy that, as opposed to deploying a whole build script. Uh, so then, when you have a new uh, EC2 image in your load balancer, it just downloads the compiled uh, image from the repository and runs it in a couple of seconds as opposed to multiple minutes. Uh, and this is just a weird thing that you run into with PHP. If you want to debug PHP, um, the server has to connect to your IDE, which is the opposite of what you would ever expect. You would think your IDE would connect to the server. Uh, it was just a problem because your, then your container has to know how to talk to your host. So in order to, to debug in PHP, you have to open up a port in your firewall for the uh, remote server to connect, which is your uh, container. And then in your container, you have to run the script to pick up the IP of the host, which is you know, getting the default route and picking out you know, via its IP and using that as the host for the debugger to connect to. Do I have any more? I think that's it. Okay. Are you using this to debug PHP? To debug PHP? Are you using like, is it xDebugger? Or are you using like um, a library? Thing? Yeah, so xDebug is um, the PHP module that you install on the server. And then uh, you can connect from PHP Storm or any IDE, uh, Visual Studio. They all speak the xDebug protocol. But the weird thing about that protocol is the server connects to the client. With Node, it's a lot easier. It, you just connect to the server. Uh, Thank you, Greg. Yeah, you're welcome.